Hello. It gives me uh, enormous pleasure to start my day here with these two um, phenomenal women on stage. Rima Nanavati comes to us from Ahmedabad. Eleni Miravilli comes to us from Athens and Nairobi. Um, they both think really deeply uh, about resilience. And I want to have this conversation today um, to really ask them to help us understand how to change the way we live in cities in an, in an age of extreme heat. So I want to start with you, Rima. You represent um, 2.8 million members mm -hmm. uh, who are informal sector workers, all women. What are the biggest impacts of extreme heat on your members? Put us in the shoes of one of them, please. Thank you so much, Sumini Ben, and I think um, very, very pertinent question. Let me take you to the streets of Ahmedabad, um, one of the very posh, bustling area called Ambavadi, and I would like you to listen to Shamina Ben, um, who's a vegetable vendor. And about five years back, she used to sell her vegetables sitting on the streets. She would spread the cloth and have her vegetables. But you know, about three years back, the building in behind where she, the pavements where she used to sit, got demolished as it was under um, you know redevelopment. And now there's a huge complex there with you know glass facade which has reflecting mirrors on it. And so the sun directly falls on her vegetables the whole day as a result of which her vegetables get wrinkled and you know they perish by afternoon and as a result of that her income reduced by almost 70 percent so she could barely earn only 100 rupees a mm. day which is a, like a dollar a day you know even today and therefore you know she looked tired she had um, you know, bristles in her feet and hand. And she said now she switched over to a hand cart. And for that, she has to walk 10, 10 to 15 kilometers a day to sell her vegetables. And then she can barely make about 150 or 200 rupees, which is $2 a day. As a result, she's pulled out her little child from school. Mm. Um, she faces so much of insecurity. And uh, this is leading to you know, mental stress, um, you know, feeling very, very insecure. There's so much of grief for loss of work, loss of income. And this leads to, you know, a lot of post uh, mental order distress. And um, on top of it, there's food insecurity, there's insecurity of livelihoods. And I'm not talking about this one person, right. but that's the situation of construction workers, sure. waste collectors who sit on the dump sites and, you know, there's poisonous fumes that come out because of the heat. This is the situation of head loaders in the cities. Head loaders are people who carry goods on, really their, on head their head and walk from one market to another. And we're talking about a city that is already quite hot. Mm -hmm. The temperatures go, this, this last summer or this summer, the temperatures went up to 52 degrees wow. centigrade. I don't know how wow. much do you translate into Fahrenheit. And therefore, you see that about 500,000 of our members in the cities were all affected. We did a quick survey of about 15,000 the members from these different trades that I just said. And it came that 87% um, of these women workers had reduced incomes, their livelihoods were affected. 78% of the members' children's education right. got affected. 62% had food insecurity, 60% um, health-related issues, and 37% of our women workers, they suffered mental health and violence. So these are the direct and indirect impacts of extreme heat in, in a city. And Annie, you have called cities 
death traps. And I was a little shaken when I heard you describe this because, you know, we love being in cities. They are the economic engines of our countries. They are where the majority of humanity lives now. Why are cities death traps in your view? Well, first of all, thanks. It's great to be here. Um, cities are really badly built. They are built for a different climate era. And uh, now, whether we are in uh, Ahmedabad or if we are in uh, a city in Canada or if we are in a city in Europe, we are really um, uh, threatened and really at risk from extreme heat. And it still is unbelievable to me that so many people don't realize that heat is the number one killer. Like mm. of all weather phenomena and extreme yeah. weather phenomena, heat is the one that has the highest by far number of mort uh, uh, people, dead mortality linked to it. So, so cities have this, because they're built with a lot of concrete and asphalt and glass and steel, they absorb heat during the day and they store heat and then at night they radiate heat. And this is really, really dangerous for people because especially at night, people should rest and uh, heat doesn't mm. allow the body to rest. So yeah. they often go to work the next day really tired and they have uh, injuries. Uh, uh, we know that we lose tons of people in cities uh, that live alone, that are old people. Like heat has this capacity to find vulnerability in cities and our cities oh. are, are not protecting our people. So that's why they're there. So heat has a, an ability to go and find the weakest people exactly. in the city. Exactly. They may be the elderly, they may be the isolated, they may be informal, informal. sector workers yeah. like Rima's members. How have cities managed to reduce some of those risks in like really practical ways? Can you give us one quick example? I think of the different examples that cities do in three categories and I'll very quickly okay. talk about them. One of them has to do with awareness ra raising, which is awareness really important, raising. right? Uh -huh. Because still people don't know that heat is a killer. So cities have been doing this thing of naming and categorizing heat waves, which mm. is really important. I think it's a game changer because people start to understand, we think in categories when it has to do with big risks, right? So people can start understanding it and naming also makes it an entity, the, the heat wave. So, so and, and, and heat waves are very localized uh, phenomena. They affect people and ecosystems differently depending on where they are, what, when do they hit, if there's humidity attached to it, if there's wind, da da da. All, I mean, it's, they're very idiosyncratic. So one is awareness. So one is, sorry, yeah, thank you because I, yeah. I, I cannot, yeah. So awareness, <laughs> which has to do, so one of the big things that cities are doing and can do is naming a category. The second one is preparedness. And preparedness is like, how can we save the most vulnerable people during heat waves? And mm. these are not very expensive things of, often, but one of the things, and I, I hope Riva will talk about it, one of the things that, for example, is beautiful is this micro insurance that you can make sure that people that are working uh, in the types of jobs that um, Riva's women are working in can actually do not have to choose between going yeah. to work and risking their lives and you know their wages maybe can be paid. So awareness, so preparedness. Preparedness also is just kind of preparing, making sure you have cooling stations, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. New York has done really a great job in preparedness, like body systems to check on people and all that. And the final one, which is a difficult one, yeah. is redesign. So how can we redesign our cities to be cooler and to save people? And, and, um, and cities are doing mm. great in that. They have been changing the way they design their public spaces, not fast enough, but there is a growing awareness around, and I can talk about this later. I wanna come back on that. <laughs> um, what lessons, Rima, have you learned from your members about their coping strategies, but more importantly, about policies that work? You know, things that uh, workers' groups can do, things that local governments can do better. What works? 
I think um, our members, the women workers in the informal sector have shown that they cannot wait for policies and programs. It's they have to survive. And therefore, I think innovations are their coping strategies for survival when the heat or the temperatures go up to 51, 52 degrees centigrade. And I think they start adaptation on their own. So I think the first and the foremost lesson is that learn from the adaptations that you know these women workers have been doing. And how do you take those adaptations to scale? That's what is the first and the foremost. The second is that when we talk about city uh, mitigation efforts and adaptation efforts, but every, the focus is on cooling or rebuilding, but I think the most important is that how does it also lead to jobs and employment generation? Hmm. Right. If that doesn't happen, then you know the mitigation and adaptation efforts of just cooling is not enough. It has to be equitable yeah. as well. The third and the most important is that heat waves don't differentiate between cities and the rural areas. And we see that in countries or in the global south, there's so much of out migration, migration from the rural areas to the mm. cities. And therefore the heat action plans have to also take into consideration, you know, how do you curb or, you know, reduce the migration and pandemic Mm -hmm. gave us a big lesson. And the last and the most important is that when you are rebuilding or redesigning the city plans or developing heat action plans, how do you look at building an economy of nurturance? How does it lead to a nurturing environment so that the mitigation efforts are cutting across mm -hmm. all the strata of the cities. I want to come back to that too briefly, but I wanted to follow up with you, Eleni, about this heat categorization system. Isn't it a little difficult because the heat danger threshold is not universally agreed upon, right? Yeah. What is a dangerous heat threshold in Seattle may be very different mm -hmm. from Ahmedabad. That's right. So how do you work around that? Should there be local danger thresholds? And what would these categories, what do these categories look like? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So it's heat is very different in different parts of the world, and it affects people and ecosystems differently. Um, I think that categorization, that the best type of categorization that uh, we have found that works best anyway, is a categorization that links heat to health which means that it links uh, the temperatures to the effect that the temperatures have to a specific mm -hmm. location. So what we do is we figure out how has heat affected my city for the previous two decades, what kind of, for example, mortality rates are linked to high temperatures, and then we make an algorithm specific for the city that pictures this relationship of the danger, basically, of mm -hmm. the impact of heat on the people. And then based on this algorithm, uh, for this particular location, right, right, you actually can start creating these categories, which is, you know, the first category is a small risk, a small percentage of people uh, we expect that might be uh, at risk for their right. health, et cetera, second yeah. and third. And then you have policies linked to them. Are Early there warning. cities that are spreading this information by with cell phone alerts yes. or anything else? Yes. Yes. Yes, of course. So, so the cities we have tried this, for example, in four cities in the U.S. and two cities in Europe that I know of. But there's other cities using this type of methodology as well. Okay. And what happens is that it's linked with uh, early warning systems and messaging, so that people hmm. know. And a whole series of policies, yeah. usually that city governments take, depending on how dangerous your day is. And it also is very important to be linked to labor uh, legislation too. And this is starting to happen also in cities and countries so that you, we know that laborers have to be protected as well. It's a, it's a crucial, crucial issue. Are you seeing, and very, very quickly, last question, are you seeing cities trying to redesign in ways that are working? Yes. Just one very quick example from you, and if, Rima, you have another example, great. The best 
thing for cities is to bring nature in. Mm. And that's the most beautiful and the, most, the best weapon we have. And if you combine a really thick and beautiful canopy together with bringing water to the surface, uh, the two, the combination of nature and mm. water, uh, can actually have the highest effect in lowering temperature. Water like fountains or any a pond, kind, any yes, kind of water any body. Any kind of water, it depends on the type of city and whether there's humidity or not. Yeah. So you can change the type of, of how you do the water kind of uh, um, um, in, uh, initiative. But yeah. yes, this is the best, the examples we have is cities uh, bringing up rivers and making really beautiful uh, tree-lined yeah. uh, for urban forests around them. And this really breathes new kind of uh, winds and temperatures and desirability. For Is there one example you've seen? Yeah, I think I can talk about how the women workers are taking initiatives in participating in redesigning of the cities. And that's through our Cleaner Skies campaign. And I think uh, the women are doing kitchen gardens on the rooftops mm. in, you know, and that helps in cooling the um, house, Their own inside house, house mm -hmm. temperature. They are also doing tree plantation on the streets. Um, the second, uh, the third measure that we are seeing is how do you have clean, uh, greener slums? So we call them as our green chawls. So the women take effort that every household has, you know, solar rooftop, uh, clean cooking device, you know, plantations, kitchen gardens. And the last and the most important is having their own ward, uh, climate war rooms, so that, you know, whether you get alerts or not, but, you know, these war rooms keep informing the children, the elders, you right. know, the workers in their particular wards Ward, that, yeah. you know, how the temperature is going their to Their neighborhoods, yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is a really great note on which to end because it shows us that it's not only about things, but it's about how we take care of one another. Can in I just have extreme? one message from yes. our members? And I'm going to sing if you allow me. And I Please. think it's the it's the message coming from the women workers, and that is that you know, ame par karishu, ame par karishu, ame par karishu ek din, oh honda antar ma, ame che vishwas. Ame par karishu ek din. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in our hearts, we do believe. So, Miniban, we shall overcome. <laughs> Whether the governments come up or not, the people, the women workers will definitely fight back the heat waves. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both. Thank you Thank all. You. We will take a very quick break. Please have a cup of coffee, tea. Um, think about what you've heard. Come back recharged. See you soon.